Hey, welcome to Black Up Lips. Bit later than advertised. At least for me, at least. Not for Rob M. Cole. No, Enk, Enk, no. That's <laughs> correct. Hey, don't worry. Everybody, everybody. It's, I have been called more things from that name. Eskimo pie, ecno, active. So, you know, it's all good stuff going on there, young man. Thanks for having me on in Germany, of all places. <laughs> yeah. Well, Germany's strong. England, I represent both countries. Oh, very so, cool. So, so I'm from England. So most of my people I know from England, but we're also, you know, in Germany as well. So just international. Ah, very cool. Okay, so going around, going around the world on a uh, Tuesday afternoon here. This is very cool. Yeah, this is very cool. Um, like I said, it's a little bit later than advertised, and I hope someone's still awake because we have like eleven o'clock here in Germany and ten o'clock in England. Well, quarter past. Um, so I hope someone's still awake. Normally, it's way past my bedtime. <laughs> Me too. Nine o'clock, and I'm in bed. You are correct. <laughs> no, no, I'm more of a night owl though. I stay awake until about yeah twelve, one o'clock. But this will be a late night because I'm going to have to edit this and then get it up on YouTube. And that takes a little bit of time, too. So, yeah. Oh, anyway, i got a question for you, man. Yes, sir. Two, two questions, first of all. Are you OK? Am I OK? Yeah. Uh, I'm doing my darndest to be OK. You know, um, I don't know if I I don't think I told you, but I almost uh, I had a very uh, near tragic accident about two, a little over two and a half years ago on a, on yeah. a boat I was working on. And um Almost didn't make it out alive. So that's a great question to ask. Yeah, that's why I'm asking because I saw your um, biography and I was like, wait there, you, you was left for dead pretty much. No yeah, one saw you. How long, was you, how long was you la- laying there before someone came and rescued you? Well, it, it wasn't about getting rescued. It was that the captain just chose not to call the Coast Guard for help. So I laid on a bed for two hours with a belt wrapped around my leg after I had lost a ton of blood on this ship I was working on up in Oregon on the Columbia River. And uh, finally, I got to shore and then they got me to an uh, urgent care, but they didn't even have an ambulance waiting for me. They only had a a guy in an SUV waiting for me. (laughs) (laughs) And then I got to the urgent care and the uh, three nurses lifted up my pajama bottoms after they took the belt off. And they took one look at the cut on my leg and said, oh, my God, ER for you. And they got an ambulance right over and another hour drive to the uh, emergency room about an hour away um, in Oregon. So it was about three and a half hours before I got any uh, any kind of medical, real medical help before. Uh, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I'm very blessed to be here talking with you today. Yeah, I guess that was your only close encounter with death, I guess. Um, uh, I've had a few others, but that was that was, that was close. <laughs> that was close. Yeah. You know how much, you know how much blood. I mean, how long is we, we're talking? Like minutes, um, seconds, hours before you? No, just I, said... I was working. You know, I, I worked in Hollywood for years on TV as a TV shopping network host, and then yeah. uh, the, my last gig ended. And then, uh, anyways, I ended up uh, in a divorce, and and uh, I got sent to Alaska. That was my next assignment, so it was pretty cool. And I got into the tour business, and then this opening came up on this cruise ship. And it was a small private cruise ship. It only held 32 passengers at the most. Most of the time we had about 20, 24 passengers. So it was really cool. So my job was to teach people about whales and bears and take them <laughs> kayaking and hiking and all that kind of cool stuff, right? Oh, man. And um, so that's what it, So at 7.05 in the morning on October 17, 2018, I was upstairs in our lounge having a cup of coffee. I go downstairs to the crew room. Now, mind you, all season long, the other 17 cruises that I did, I had a cabin, like the normal passenger cabins, because we weren't sold out, and I was the cruise host, so I was right up with the passengers. Yeah. The only cruise all season that we were not sold out is the one I was down in the crew hall, and I went into the men's room down there. A guy took a piece of the floor out, about a three-foot by three-foot section of floor that went five feet down into the bottom of the boat. Oh, and uh, I was not aware of this. So I just stepped out of the bathroom, fell into this hole, shredded my leg, wrecked my arm, shoulders, neck. Oh, God, uh, it was uh, it was not a fun place to be. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm seriously. So I lost. So I was really, really dizzy as all heck. So I luckily I didn't fall into the hole. My when I stepped, my body weight pulled me forward and I landed on the floor in front of me. So I was lying, my midsection was lying over this hole. And I'm dizzy as all heck. My feet are behind me. I'm looking down and all I see is this red water below me. 
and I didn't know what it was. And then I looked behind me and I saw this gigantic puddle of blood and I'm like, oh my God. And that's when I started screaming. Mm -hmm. And luckily there was a deckhand that had just come off his shift and was like three feet down the hall in his room. He heard the screaming and he came out because the guy that left the hole just kneeled there. He didn't help me at all. I don't know what was going on with him, but he just kneeled there. It didn't help me. And so luckily I got up and we got a towel wrapped around my leg. We got into my crew room. I had the guy take a belt off of my pants and wrap it around my pajama bottoms. And I laid on a bed for two hours while we got to shore. So it was pretty hairy. That, that's crazy. That's crazy. But I'm glad right you're all right. The, yeah, right before the show, I just went to another doctor. I, I, I'm still averaging at two years and seven months into this. I'm still averaging at minimum of five doctors a week, still trying to get. Really? Getting, yeah. Well, yeah. So what was the extent of the injury then? Did you sever I an shredded, artery? Or? No, I shredded my shin, a, a good portion of my shin, about four inches long, about an inch wide and about a five millimeters deep. So there's like almost no skin left on the top of my shin right now. Oh, God. And it broke open about uh, six weeks ago, maybe seven weeks ago, and I had to get rushed to the ER again. And so what happens is this is the key to the success here is that why I'm still worried is there's a thing called cellulitis. I don't know if you know what that is, Yeah, but it gets into your, it gets into your tissues and stuff. And and if it turns septic, Mm. then you can lose your leg or you can die. Um, So I've had cellulitis three times in the last two and a half years since this accident. So, um, and so you can imagine what I go through on a daily basis because here's the key. The year before, 2017 we had a lady on the ship a passenger yeah. just happened to misstep the steps fell down broke her ankle coast guard rushes out 120 miles from Juneau, alaska we were up in alaska <laughs> then uh mm-hmm. it was nighttime we were rushing around the copter comes down you know the basket comes on i'm helping the coast guard anyways we saved this lady's life but six months later they could never get the infection out so they had to chop her leg off oh that's no how she, that's how she ended her vacation so I have firsthand knowledge of what happens yeah. when you can't get the infection out. So it's, it's been, you know, it hasn't been the easiest time for two and a half years plus, but you know, I fight to uh, keep on fighting. Oh man. Oh no. So I guess my second question is rendered um, invalid now because I was going to ask you, cause you're living in Alaska. You still in Alaska. Oh, I, I just got back. I was actually there last week. I was in Juneau hanging out with the bears and the glaciers. Yes, I'm in. Yeah. I'm, 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 in I'm currently in Los Angeles right now. Okay. Because not a lot of people know this, but I've got a dream. It's not like my bucket list. It's actually one of the last things on my bucket list. I've actually fulfilled most of my life's bucket list now. This is this podcast. And the, what, what I'm going to tell you now is the last two things. So basically, I would love to go to Alaska because I'm a big, I'm a, how would you say? I'm a, conno, I'm a salmon connoisseur. Oh, you know, you gotta, there you go. <laughs> you got to do it taste wine and know how to like describe it. I'm like that with, yes. um, with salmon. So I really want to go over there, do some fishing, you know, and catch some fresh salmon and actually bake it on the side of the river, on the riverbank. And like, yes. just really just eat it right there and there. Then, you know, it's, that's, that's. Well, the- let me tell you what, young man, if you have any chance of going between now and October, yeah. Now is the time to go because I, you know, I'm sure you know because of COVID, the cruise season is closed up up there. Yeah. So there's only very, very minimal uh, tourism. As a matter of fact, last Sunday when I was there for two hours straight, I was the only person at the Mendenhall Glacier, which yeah. normally on a Sunday will have about 10,000 visitors on. Really? So if you're going to go to Alaska and get it off your bucket list, I'm telling everybody I possibly know that this is the summer to go because you have almost your own private island out there. Yeah. It's so cool. And, and I'll tell you about salmon. Mm-hmm. I never ate salmon until I went to Alaska in 2014. I just didn't like it for some reason. And then I got flown over to this little island and they had a, a thing for tourists. And you paid $300 for a plane ride and this meal and everything. I'm like, wow, this must be a great meal if it's $300, right? (laughs) Well, sure enough, they gave me one because I was was part of the tour business. So they give you stuff so that you'll you'll talk about it, right? And sell it. I got to tell you what, they cooked this stuff. It came out of the uh, the Canadian, one of the rivers in Canada, uh, right up the road. And it was as fresh as could be. They cook it on a stuff called alder wood. 
and it's a type of tree and they cooked it and I had that and oh my god I almost went back into the kitchen and mauled the chef and just tried to steal every last piece of it uh, you have you have got a good thought process going on there. and you know what's cool is where they cook it out on the grill as soon as they get done cooking all of the juices from the salmon and all the oils end up in uh, like beach sand and yeah. you got two or three black bears that come out and start eating <laughs> sand in the oil. It's pretty cool. I, say, yeah. Yeah, I, don't about, I don't know about that, though. I don't want to encounter any black bears, man. I'm not, I'm not up for that stuff. Oh, let me tell you what, though. It is so cool. The bears don't want you. They want the salmon. They want the blueberries. You know, that's what they want. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, you can be walking up in, in, like, say, Juneau, for example. And I've been all over Southeast Alaska. Let's just take mm-hmm. Juneau. And I'm walking up the street and Main Street. And all of a sudden, at like six in the morning, a little 350 pound black bear will just stroll right across you. And uh, you just say, hey, what's going on, buddy? How are you? And he just keeps walking. <laughs> wait, now, wait, wait. I always thought bears were aggressive. Okay, no, the they grizzly bear. Well, not even the grizzly bear. The polar bears are the worst. The polar bears are the yeah. ones that don't have any en- enemies. But even the grizzly. So here's the deal. Just in case you do cross that Alaska off your bucket list and you yeah. want to go up there. <laughs> It, they tell you if a black bear attacks you, I mean, you, you never hear of people getting attacked by bears once in a blue moon, really, right? Because yeah. bears don't want you. And plus, they can smell you. They have, supposedly, they have a sniffing power more than seven times a bloodhound. So they can wow. smell you as long as you're making noise. The only time you really get in trouble with a bear is if you walk upon it and spook it. Like maybe mm-hmm. it was sleeping and you walked upon it and it jumped up and now it thinks you're or you're running. You know, people yeah. that are running, they think it's prey. So yeah. if you're running, they always tell you, the joke is you don't have to be the fastest one in your party. You just can't be the slowest one when it comes to surviving a bear. So, <laughs> but, but they don't want you, right? I mean, yeah. you know, they want the blueberries and they want the salmon. So, and so the deal is if you see one coming, you're just supposed to wave your hands big in the air so you look bigger than them. And they don't yeah. want to they they get engaged. And also, um, you're supposed to make noise. And yeah. the, so, so, so I'll, I'll give you this one. So the black bears are about 350, 400 pounds. Mm-hmm. You're told if they come after you, if they do come after you, you got to fight them or they kill you. Yeah. So you got to punch them in the nose, whatever, and they'll run away. You might yeah. still get clawed, but you, the grizzly bears, you're supposed to roll up in a ball. The grizzly bears don't want to kill you. They want to dominate you. Yeah. And so you roll up in a ball and you lay on the ground. They still might take a swipe or two at you. Mm. But what they do is they go and they hide behind rocks or a tree and they'll watch you for like a half hour, 40 minutes. Yeah. If you move in that time, then they come out and grab you. But if you don't move, it's like, so you know, hopefully, hopefully neither one of us or anybody listening here today will ever be in that position. But you got to know this kind of stuff if you're going to yeah. be out in nature, right? See, you might be telling me this now and I might actually have to use this in like like two years or something when I'm in Alaska and that's I'm, what I'm saying. Counter, you know, I'm like, oh, man, man, it was that Ek, what was his name? Ekno or Enno? <laughs> that guy told me, okay. I won't remember your name, but I'll be like, he told me it was that. Oh my gosh, good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, man. I, I can't wait to, for you to get there. I know I'm looking forward to it. It's really like so high on my priority list. You know, I'm checking out who I, who do I know. Like, as soon as you said Alaska, I was like, okay, he's from Alaska. So he's putting me more contact there. So, yeah. yeah I go yeah. back I go back and forth. So feel free to contact me. So no, no doubt. Um, you know, um, as, soon as, as soon as this injury is done, I'll probably go up there. But I was trying to get up there ahead of time. And I was planning on it last summer. But COVID came and it killed all the jobs. So there was, really wasn't any sense of me going up there after COVID killed all the jobs. So, no, no. yeah. Okay. So you started off in broadcasting. Yes. Was it like Q- QVC or something? I don't know. What, what was it? I actually started off in high school many years ago when I had hair like you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. That's, that's two years of hard work. Yeah, I know. So I used to have some of that stuff. And uh, so I helped uh, my old high school teacher raise $18,000. We had a group of about uh, half a dozen of us or so. Mm-hmm. And we actually started a 200-watt FM radio station back in Rhode Island, the smallest of the United States. Okay. And it's still going today, many, many decades later, and many folks have uh, had very wonderful broadcasting careers. One of our friends that ends up working for NASCAR, the big racing association, uh, is one of the announcers on the networks. Uh, 
One of my friends owns his own uh, little radio station back in a small town and with him and his wife and uh, my old high school teacher actually does a Christian broadcasting show with him and his wife that airs all across uh, America uh, every week as well. So a lot of pretty cool stuff has happened about that. And yeah, then I, um, so the short of it is I got really good at what I did, but then I got really into the entertainment partying part of it. Mm-hmm. And I went from being on a nationally syndicated radio show host. I did a sports show uh, nationally syndicated out of Boston and then I got really drunk and really stoned. And then I ended up living out of the Greyhound bus station in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Yeah. And uh, that's where my life started to change a little bit. And a few years later, I ended up back in New England. I got a DUI on November 29th, 19, or to November 28th, 1992. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got stopped by the wonderful police officers less than like a football field away from the police station at two in the morning. <laughs> Oh, and uh, my old girlfriend came to pick me up about four in the morning and I just looked at her and said, man, I'm done. And so I've been uh, sober ever since November 29th of 1992, 28 and a half years now. Oh, that's great. That's great. I mean, how did you end up getting into, I mean, you suggested that, well, I was saying in your brother that you got into drugs and alcohol, but how did you, I don't know, was you from a family that were like that or something, you know, how's that? My family, yes, good question. My family is actually, unfortunately, uh, my mother's mother died uh, without any liver left in her. And um, so it kind of started from there. And my brother, unfortunately, uh, 28 years old, my brother David, uh, rest in heaven now, he passed away at 28 from this. And so, yeah, I had to break the cycle. So fortunately, I've been able to do it up to this point in time. So um, I spend a lot of my time uh, when I'm not at doctor's offices. I go to a lot of uh, meetings, recovery mm-hmm. meetings and different places like that, just trying to help other people have a better life. Yeah, I think uh, I like uh, I don't know if you know Russell Brand because he was a recovering. How do you call it? A recovering addict. And um, he always says it's once you've been an addict, you can you never really you can never recover from it. There's always a chance you could go back once you become, it's so powerful, you know, so you need to kind of always remind yourself, I'm done with it. That's so. correct. You are, well, yes. And it's a daily process. Even at 28 years sober, I mean, I start my day, you know, we'll talk about my book here in a second, you know, my yep. God book, but I start every day, you know, you don't do it on your own, first of all, right? As Russell mm-hmm. will tell you, um, it's all about finding, uh, but it's not all that hard if you're really into it, right? It's one alcoholic or drug addict or whatever they have, gambling addict, overeater addict, talking to another to get a relatable story. But yes, it's ongoing. You don't graduate after a year or five years. You don't get a degree and go, you know, hey, Rob, you know, here's your certificate. Put it on the wall. You'll never drink again. Yeah. No, you you have a daily reprieve based on, based, uh, based on any spiritual maintenance that you are willing to do for yourself. Yeah. So I wake up every day and thank God for another day. And then I ask him, how do I go out and do his bidding in the world and not mine? So it's a, you got to get out of your most alcoholics. We're, we're, we're very selfish and self-centered when we come into the program. Mm-hmm. And if we, keep, if we keep living that life, life's probably going to suck. Yeah, <laughs> That's the bottom true. line, right? So we got to start. Here's the weird part. We got to start thinking more about you mm-hmm. than us. So I have to think more about you every day than I have to think. And my life gets better. It's crazy how it works. <laughs> you know, and I, I look to go out and be, and then we have to be of service, right? We have to be service somewhere. I volunteer at a really cool animal rescue on the weekends and Mm -hmm. I spend eight hours there and they rescue all the dogs and cats and and pigs and there's goats that that are just about to be euthanized, like maybe the next day or maybe they're black pit bulls or Mm -hmm. ones that aren't as adoptable. And so I get to work with all of these and that's my service work. And it's so cool because I get therapy from them as well because these dogs are all amazing dogs. You know, and the goats and the three pigs that they have up there too. So, but the whole point is, yeah, you it, you are correct. It's an ongoing thing. The day the day that you think that you are recovered and you think you got this thing down to a science and you won't drink again is probably the day you're going to drink. Okay. Or That's use good. whatever whatever your your addiction is. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, I, I cannot identify with addiction because I've never had one. I've just, I've been, I don't know what it was. I remember my, when I was growing up, my mom used to smoke and we used to say how much we didn't like her doing it. And then at some point she kicked the habit. And I think it's because of that little, you know, that little stint where my mom was smoking when I was alive, because we was quite young when she gave it up. I think I just always built a hate for that sort of stuff. So I never drank alcohol. I never smoked. 
I never done any kind of drugs. You know, actually, I, I take that back. I um, had a brownie. <laughs> oh, my God. For the first oh, time. <laughs> For the first time two years ago, I was like, I'm gonna try one of these brownies, man, because you know I'm 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 almost 40. So I was like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna eat a brownie. <laughs> so yeah, you're almost that. 40 and you almost... still have a full head of hair. Nothing to complain about right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually really true, actually. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so after that, you um you attempted to reconnect your relationship with God, which came to a you know, took a backwards turn. Because you had some sort of encounter. What was that? Well, I had a really unique situation happen. And uh, you hit it on the head with that one. I came out to California. So I got uh, 11 months sober back in New England. Mm -hmm. My dad gave me a car to use. And I drove out to Southern California, right in uh, L.A. suburbs. And I ended up answering an ad in a, in a magazine or a newspaper that was, it was a Christian gal looking for a roommate. And I'm like, Oh, great. I don't know anybody in town. This gal's looking for a roommate. She probably doesn't drink and smoke and party and do drugs. And that'd be a great place for me to. And uh, she calls me up and and says uh, back. And she says, you know, I can't live with you because my religious beliefs say that man and women can't live together. Okay, fine. But meet me at this church. And it was a, it's a famous church out here. The pastor was well known around the world. I don't name him because it, it was my experience that happened that you read about and, and, and so on. But um, nonetheless, uh, one day I was there and they have a big giant place with a few thousand people in the main chapel. And then they also have a little back room that has about 200 people in it with a big giant screen TV for those of us who either get there late or don't want to sit. Anyways, I was sitting back there that day And as soon as the service got up, this famous pastor came walking into our area and I got up and my eyes caught his eyes. And I swear to you, it was the freakiest thing that ever happened to me in my life. And I just jumped back and I just looked at him and I said, oh, my God, if there's ever truly a devil on this planet, who's that guy? I was looking at him. And his name? eyes were dark and, and, and he looked like, you know, and he looked at me like, oh, my God, somebody can see through me. Yeah. And I grabbed my coat and started running out of the church. And I ran like a half a mile down the street. <laughs> and at the same time that I started running, he immediately took a left hand turn and went down the hallway. And normally he would hang out with everybody and talk to the congregation afterwards. Mm-hmm. But. And I never went back to church until nine years later. And I had this miraculous encounter with my now ex-wife, but she's the one that ended up getting me back into the church and stuff. Mm. All right. So, wait, I'm just trying to think. It wasn't that guy. What's his name? Normally the owl. It wasn't that guy. You didn't end up in the church of Satan, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no. the girl you. She was like, i got this good church. I trust you. I love it. And he was like, yeah, okay, I'll come. <laughs> and yeah, no doubt. Because everything was black and red and they're like, hold on a minute. No, I'm pretty sure the gentleman passed away now. I'm pretty sure he's passed away. But uh, nonetheless, he was very well known in the church community back then. And it was just a freaky, you know, we all have different encounters in life. And we all, you know, have different tastes and smells and feelings. And that was, I I never had such a scary feeling in my life as I did that particular day. Okay, so um, what was the continual stream of coincidental circumstances that you, you know, once you met your first wife? Boy, everything just started happening. I mean, I ended up being, I ended up going to a place that's now out of business. That's a world was another world famous place called the Crystal Cathedral, mm-hmm. which uh, there's a show called The Hour of Power that is now run by the grandson. But the pastor, Robert Schuler, who's passed on, mm-hmm. uh, made the Crystal uh, Cathedral world famous. And, and, and if you've never been there, it's down near Disneyland in, in Anaheim area. And it's all glass. The whole church is made out of glass. It's a big giant thing. His philosophy was he didn't want anything blocking the sunlight of the spirit while they were in there ser- doing services on Sunday. So it's pretty cool. And I ended up running the homeless ministry down there as the head volunteer. My wife got on board. Uh, the two kids got on board as well. And we, we, uh, we really built it up. They had nobody going there. And, and I said, well, you know why you have nobody going there? Because you're not treating people as they would be treated, as they should be treated, just because somebody has a drinking problem or a drug problem or an mm-hmm. overeating problem, they're somebody's son, they're somebody's daughter, they're somebody's mom, dad, they're just like you and I, they're just going through a tough period in life, you know, yeah. 
And so we don't toss them out with the bathwater. Then they don't, nobody grows up, right? And says, I can't wait till I become an alcoholic and live on the streets. That's going to yeah. be awesome. You know, yeah. nobody does that. So they weren't treating the people. And I told them, I said, you're not treating people like people should be treated. And they only had like 20 people coming to this Monday lunch that they were serving. And this is a worldwide church, right? They're known all over the place. And so I asked them to let me take over and my wife helped me and the two kids. And uh, we got a great group. And within two months, we were serving between 250 and 300 meals every Monday. Okay. And we just turned it around. And I used to hug everybody. And one, uh, one day, the, <laughs> the pastor that got, um, was hired and he was above me, I was only a, the head volunteer. He said to my wife one day, he said, boy, your husband must really stink when he comes home on Mondays, huh? <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? And he said, he hugs those people. Like, <laughs> what do you mean I hug those people? That, that's, this is the problem why your church is failing. Because you're not, th- these are people. This set some, I just hugged somebody's brother or somebody's father. Yeah. And showed them that somebody cared about them in this world. That's what mm-hmm. we got to do. You know, we only have two jobs in life. To encourage each other and to inspire each other. That's exactly. it. Amen. That's our job. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what we got to do. It's, and that's what you try to do with your podcast, right? You, you, yeah. I mean, look, look at you. You got to be doing something right in life because you have the biggest, most amazing smile and brightest <laughs> glow coming off of your face right now. Man, I'll tell you what, if we ever had, a, if we ever, if you had to have a blackout in Germany or in England, all they got to do is stick <laughs> you on top of the Capitol building or whatever they call it over there, and you will light up the whole country. I, I promise you. Yeah. yeah. They, you they got do call the me spirit sometimes. going on, man. You got it going on. Thanks, man, Rob. Yeah, you're awesome. You're awesome yourself, actually, man. Um, your energy, I can see, I can feel your energy from here too, man. It's it's amazing. I think it's a it's a match made in heaven. Isn't it pretty cool? People don't <laughs> understand that. Isn't it cool though? Seriously, I tell people all the time, even though we're on a computer screen and whatever it's Zoom or Skype or whatever it is, Facebook Live, whatever you use, right? Yeah, you can, you can still feel. Yeah. yeah. Energy when it's good or bad it's kind of interesting isn't it it's weird it's weird but it's nice i like it you yeah know, it's a, especially in this day and age where there's covid going around and i know it can be i guess to talk to you and not get sick right fantastic fantastic they think of everything <laughs> <laughs> um i wanted to ask you something now it's, well, it's the coincidence you had asked about the coincidences and oh, yeah. and, I, and i started seeing like so many coincidences, like something would happen like today with our podcast, right? They were doing it here. And then I would say, why was I on this podcast today? And then all of a sudden something will happen three months from now. And I go, Oh, that was kind of interesting too. And then three months, well, and all of a sudden the year's gone by and I'm like, Oh my gosh, it all started with that podcast that I did. And this is where it took me to. And that's kind of how it's all happened. And, and that's how we got into this, um, the book. Is it God or coincidence? Yes. Coming to grips with the unexpected wonders in life. And I I can, you know, there's eight great stories in here that are simply stories where God lined up all of these incredible events that would make no sense. Matter of fact, I actually had a, a very good friend read this book and said, you know, if I didn't know you. I think you were full of it because these stories, <laughs> it's not possible for these stories to happen. And I'm like, but us as man wouldn't be able to create them, but God could create them. Yeah. And that's what he did. You know, and he so he created these great, amazing stories. And what's really cool about it is, you know, I almost flunked out of high school because I couldn't pass English. And so here I am all these years later writing a book. book. Telling yeah. me to spell your name right. <laughs> Well, but what's interesting is my one of my old high school English teachers is the guy that wrote the foreword to the book. Oh, really? And when I called him up to ask him, he was amazed. I mean, I could hear the tears in his eyes on the other end. And I'm like, and I thought he was, you know, like upset or something. And I'm like, listen, if you read it and you don't like it, just let me know. You don't have to write anything for me. I, I understand And he said, no, he said, I'm so honored that you would call me after all these years and ask me to write the forward for your book for you. And I was like, wow, how awesome is that? I mean, it's like everything, everything fell into place. Do you have time for me to tell you a quick story? Sure, sure. 
All right, so I want to tell people, because COVID's happening now, and a lot of stuff is happening, and a lot of people don't have a lot of faith, right? And a lot of people are wondering, and they're living in fear. So I'm going to tell you, we just talked about the fact that I had this bad accident, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the insurance company for the boat company, you know, they don't want to pay you a lot of money while you're going through this because they want you to suffer. They want you to give up and settle and not get healthy. So literally, I lived on $7 a day for the first two and for about the first two years plus of my injury up until just a $7 couple of months ago. Dollars a day. Yeah, because after they only give you a couple of dollars I, uh, for your rent and stuff, uh, afterwards I had $7 left over. That's what I lived on. Mm -hmm. So I say that specifically because this is going to be the first chapter in my next book. <laughs> and I have to write another book. You know how I know I have to write one? Because everybody what? keeps calling me and telling me, you got to write another book. <laughs> so, so here's how the book got put together. This, this will help hopefully somebody in your audience that doesn't have much faith right now and thinks they need stuff in order to accomplish stuff. Whereas I trust in God and he provides everything because he has everything that you and I need to have a great life, right? Yep. So here you go. So I write the book. I'm two years into the book. And, and, and if I had published it the way I wrote it, trust me, nobody would have <laughs> <laughs> They would have said, who is this lunatic author, right? But so anyways, I'm two, two years in. I got the injury on the boat. I'm still trying to write to take away. And actually, writing helps with depression. Anybody that's going through any type of depression, rather than alcohol or drugs yeah. or anything like that, try right. writing. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I'm telling you, it is, it is medicine. It is medicine, yeah. writing. So I'm writing this thing. I'm two years in. I go, okay, God, I don't have a writing coach. I don't have a copy editor. I don't have a proofreader. And I don't have another author to write some nice things on the back of the book. And, and I'm living on $7 a day. I don't have any of this stuff, Lord. So there's no sense of me finishing this book because it's not going to go anywhere. I need somebody to design the cover. And God said to me, Rob, did I ask you for any of that? Mm -hmm. He said, I asked you to write the book. Yeah. I didn't ask you for any of the other stuff. So wouldn't you know it, as soon as I say that, he says, why don't you call your friend David? He's a marketing director. He was at, uh, at one of the big studios here in Hollywood. I call him up and I say, hey, Dave, what's up? And he says, oh, I just got laid off from my job. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm writing a book, but I, I, I can't finish it because I don't have any help. And he goes, oh, well, I'm pretty good at that stuff. Why don't you come over to my house? So Dave has me come over his house almost every Monday for a year and a half until we published the book. Gave me four hours of free time every week that I went there designed the book cover for free, loaded everything up on Amazon, designed the inside of the book, helped me with the writing. He was my writing coach, not a dime, blessed me. Awesome. Then, then I said, Dave, we should have somebody check our work, you know? And, and he said, yeah, we need to find a copy editor. I'm standing outside my place. I was at uh, down the street here in LA near Universal Studios. And my neighbor comes out and I'm talking to her. And I said, yeah, I got this book and I can't go any farther. I got to find a copy editor. I don't want to find one. And she goes, well, don't you know what I do for a living? And I said, no. She goes, I'm a copy editor. I said, are you serious? Amazing. She goes, yeah. She said, I've been a copy editor for 30 years. I worked at a publishing company. She said, give it to me. I'll do it after I, my paid job gets done at night, and I'll do it for free, and I'll bless you with it. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So that's how I got copy edited. So then I said, well, we really need a proofreader, right? She said, yeah, that would be good. I always, we always have two or three people check our work. So I call up this friend of mine, Lee, in Northern mm -hmm. California. And I say, Lee, could you write a blurb for the back cover? Because he's a life coach. I said, if you like it, if you don't. So I send him a copy of the book. And he says, by the way, I, he calls me, he says, I got your book. And I don't know if I ever told you this, but my wife and I are professional proofreaders. <laughs> so while I'm reading your book, I'll proofread it for you as well. And I'll let you know, that's how it got proofread, right? So then I go to this uh, writer's meeting, a uh, uh, recovery meeting here in, uh, in, um, uh, Pacific Palisades, Malibu area in, in, in Hollywood. And, uh, and, and, and I know the couple of writers there, but I'm not really like close friends with them. So I mm -hmm. said, Lord, I really need uh, somebody to write, you know, something nice for the back cover, a real author. You know, I don't want to just write about me and tell people they can go online or whatever and find out about me. So Lord, God says, call this guy, Paul, who always says nice things about you. Now, Paul is a Pulitzer Prize nominated author who's won awards around the world. He's well known in writing circles. I'm like, God, I can't call him. And he goes, <laughs> why not? He said, I told you to call him. You asked me. And he said, now you want to argue with me. He said, just <laughs> call Paul. 
I call up Paul. Hey, I got this thing. Any chance you could help me? Paul says, oh, my God, Rob, I would be so honored to help you. I'm so glad you called and asked me. And I said, well, I just need like one or two small lines. Well, if you read the back of my book cover, you will see that Paul wrote eight lines. Okay. And he compared my book to two best-selling books. One is Returning by Dan Wakefield, and the other was uh, Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. Okay. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So that's how it got put together. So no money out of pocket, living on $7 a day. Mm. And if you go on Amazon and read the reviews, you'll notice that the reviews are incredible. They're absolutely wonderful. And people are already calling me to tell me to write another book as well. And the audio book, I'll just wrap it up on a, on a bow for you. The audio book, now it's going to be like three, five thousand dollars $5,000. You, you're, you're an editor, right? You know what it takes to audit. And you got to take out the, on here, we don't have to. But on the, on, when you put something on Audible, you got to take out all the P's and the pops and the breasts and all that yeah. other stuff. So God says, we'll call your friend Rick. And I said, I can't call. That's a big project, right? And he says, you ask me again who to ask, help you. And I tell you whether you ought to argue with me. So I call my friend Rick, who's a professional editing uh, guy, sound engineer here in Hollywood for 30 years. And I said, Rick, I got my book done and it's going good. And, and um, But people tell me I need an audio book. He goes, oh, dude, why don't you just come over to my house and I'll turn on the record button and you can record it. And then I'll just edit it for you in my free time. It might take me a month or two, but I'll get it done for you. And it'll yeah. be better than anyone else's. And I'm like, that's how the audio book got done. <laughs> so... I'm just telling that story because I'm sure that somebody listening right now is going through a really, really hard time. And they're thinking, I don't have the money to live my dreams or the equipment to live my dreams or whatever it is that I need. Mm -hmm. But if you have faith, I can tell you this, if you have faith in God and you ask him and you pray, he'll give you what you need. If you're on the path to do something good for mankind, He's going to provide you just like you. You have whatever you need to do this podcast, yeah. right? You have it because you have the spirit and you have the willingness and the desire to put out something good to help someone in this world have a better day today. Yes. And so you've got it all. So somebody listening right now, if you're down and out and things aren't going the way you want them to, and you're looking at all the negatives of the world, maybe just maybe if you get on your knees and looked up, you might get some answers. That's what happened to me. And, and this whole book is about coincidences just like that. Uh, and that's the question that you had asked me earlier. Yeah, man, that's, that's awesome. It's, um, it's one of those things, you know, where you think, like, I think you've got to be brave to ask, you know. I think a lot of people are scared to ask for things. You know, a lot of, I don't know what it is with society today, but for some reason, you've got to make it on your own. But I'm always telling people, ask the question, go around, talk to people, you know, people, there's, there's, there's so much information stored in each person and you just got to get it out of them, you know, ask the right questions, you get the information out. But if you sit down, a lot of people want to be they're lone wolves, you know, they want to walk around and I made it on my own, I can do it on my own. And you're like, no, you don't have to do it on your own. Like you said, you can ask, you can start by asking God or the universe for some people and yep. then that'll start the chain reaction. Yeah, I'm, yeah, whoever you believe in, you're right. It doesn't have to be God, just anybody. Hey, listen, I have a friend, David, and he just prays. He doesn't believe in anything. Yeah. Seriously, he tells you, I don't believe in anything, but he prays. He literally yeah. gets down and prays. And he says, when I pray, I'm not praying to anybody, anything or whatever. He said, but when I pray, I just feel better. Yeah. And he said, it's amazing. Things happen that I actually <laughs> pray for. I'll actually get some some things that, you know, and, it, and remember, it's not about praying for ourselves, right? Hey, God, please give me the winning lottery ticket, you know, <laughs> give me the free plane ticket to Alaska, you know, whatever it is, right? I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but see, but see, I can pray for that for you. Ah. Then it works. The, so when it, when it happens, I, I'll be like, that guy? It's that guy again, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> see that? So I can pray for you for good stuff to happen to you. And uh, but if we pray for just things, good things to happen for us, they're probably not always going to, to happen. We might get a bunch of but this book, I would have never thought. And now I've already got people calling me who have read it and said, oh, dude, I got a, I got a coincidence for you. Let me tell you about one of the next chapters for your next book. So I've got <laughs> all these people already calling me with ideas for the next chapter. And 
Uh, also, I have another book that I'm, I'm trying to uh, finish up here uh, called uh, Shipwrecked. And it's about my 23 cruises in Alaska, mm-hmm. ending up with me almost dying on the last one. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. But what about your other book, uh, God Bless America? You know, um, before it's too late, of course. Uh, that one that one was a first one. That You know, it's funny because it's, it's on Amazon. So somebody bought it. Mm-hmm. The publisher's out of business. Somebody bought a copy of it, apparently, and they they were selling it. I don't know if it's still up there. For $902 was the Whoa. selling. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. If you could, if somebody thinks that my book is worth $902, that particular book, God Bless America, Before It's Too Late, that was my first book. And that was more of a, uh, a challenging uh, type of a book where I used to do a podcast like yourself called In Your Face. And it was Monday through Friday on a, on a station that's not around anymore, but we did it for three and a half years and it challenges. So the theme of the show was to inspire, motivate, and challenge each of us to become the best we can be for ourselves, our country, and most importantly, God. No. So it was kind of, you know, people are complaining about the state of the world, but a lot of people aren't doing anything positive, but complaining, Right. That's true. And, yep. and so as I share every day, all I can do is make a little Rob's little piece of the world, like basically the hula hoop around me. All yep. I can do every day is just make that better. Yep. Right. Like you like you offered me this opportunity to come here. So my job was to be ready to go when you were ready to be on time, to be here, you know, to respect you and all that stuff. But when I go into the store and the cashier is there or the gas station and everybody else is complaining about the prices and everything else. And I always say, how are you doing today? You know, just yeah. little things like hold the door open for somebody. Let somebody cut you in on the freeway instead of trying to race ahead and stop. Just, it, we never get asked to do giant things in this world, mm-hmm. but the small things to most people are giant things. Yeah, yeah that's true. And that right. goes back to that whole lone wolf mentality that we have, you know, perpetuating through society. Everyone thinks the need to do it alone. Um also, the, this uh, this this complaining thing that reminds me of something I said to someone on one of the previous shows about conspiracy theorists who go around telling us that this guy is a secret government, and all these guys are trying to kill us and whatever. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. So what we're we gonna do about it? Um, um, and everything goes silent. All of a sudden, it's like, guys, we need solutions, man. <laughs> you know, we need. And solutions that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. What am I doing today to add something positive to the world? That's the whole thing. And and I gotta tell you, I was surprised. You know, when I wrote this particular book, the one I have on Amazon right now. So just to answer your question, there's not really any of the God Bless America books. Somebody, whoever you see that on Amazon, it's a personal, somebody has that book and posted it on Amazon. <laughs> and because it's, I wrote it, it's under my it's under my category. So, but this book here, I am just getting the most wonderful reviews on this particular book. The audio book is available, Kindle's available and the paperback as well. So you can, you can grab a copy of this if you want. And uh, uh, the stories in here are truly bringing people to tears, tears of joy. They're really touching people's hearts. And people are coming to me and go, dude, I was crying. You brought out stuff in me. I was reading those stories and you brought out stuff in me that I didn't know was hidden inside of me. I have people, I have people that have bought extra copies to leave in their car. So when they see people that they think it could help, they just have them with them at all times. So I've been getting some amazing, amazing response out of this. And, and you know, it's, it's all God's stories. I didn't make up the stories. I was just asked to write them down. Okay. You know, so, and so, yeah, so they're all incredible God stories. It's like a biography then for you. It is a biography, it, basically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, it's a it's a memoir. Yes, absolutely correct. Because the first chapter is about, you know, my life, you kind of let the people know who you are as an unknown author and some of the crazy stuff you went through and stuff. So you can let them know as you read with the with the pastor and stuff. So you, you can see why it was uh, set up to write this book and, and, and that I wasn't always a God junkie and that my life has turned and twisted and shaped and all this other stuff. So for me to be able to see all this stuff, so in other words, if anybody else is out there lost and, you know, they just don't believe in much or they haven't seen much what they consider luck or anything like that, you know, maybe we got to just start and breathe and do a little meditating. And I'll tell you what, meditating really, really, really that's helps. The key. Yeah. That's Every the key. day, you know, and it doesn't have to be sitting on a couch or a bed. 
I go out in nature and I, I go to the, we have a 99 cent store here in America, at least yeah. in Los Angeles. So I get a, a bag of peanuts and I feed the squirrels as I walk and I talk to the squirrel, crows and just little stuff like that. When I'm in Alaska, I feed the ravens. I get two loaves of bread every morning and I play catch with the ravens, about 30 of them getting around in a circle. And ravens, yeah. if you haven't known, are very spiritual birds. Ravens and eagles, uh, talking about Alaska, are the two Clinket tribes the mm-hmm. clan to the clinket. And uh, so they're very, very spiritual birds. So I have a little powwow session with them every morning when I'm up in Southeast Alaska. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm just put it back a bit. I'm surprised you don't go find the person who's selling your book. <laughs> they probably got a distribution deal under your name. Oh, uh, you know, it's very interesting. You know, I have a few copies of, for myself, but I, I mean, I don't know if it still says $902 for the, for no, it's the actually says. 1899 here but they're still able to sell it i could yeah, buy I this book so. right now yeah they're selling it they're selling it on amazon so whoever has it can sell it but but at one point in time it said 902 dollars and i was like people were calling me going dude you're selling your book for 902 dollars I, <laughs> I said i'm not even selling it at all i don't even i don't even have it up there somebody bought it and is selling it Okay, someone, um, some tape publishing and enterprise, they've got the rights to it. Actually, they've got the rights to it from UK. Yeah, they're guess. out of they're out of business now. Oh, be, okay, yeah. So if I try to order the book, I wouldn't get a copy then? No, but uh, if you give me your address, I have a copy. I'll be happy to send you. <laughs> I'm going to actually get your um, Kindle. I'm going to get your uh, book on the Kindle. Awesomeness. Not the I Kindle, sorry, the audio book, Audible, because I listen to a lot of audio books. Yeah, I'd um, love to have your uh, your feedback on that. That yeah, would be I, fabulous. I got I got like two books I got to review now, so yeah, excellent. I love this in audible um format because that makes it easier for me when I'm driving to work or wherever. You know, I can listen to it in one go and then be like, great, take notes, then review it. Absolutely, yeah. No, thank you. I'd appreciate that your your feedback. Yes, definitely. Uh, okay, so I don't know how long we are we, are we uh, okay we're going on a little bit. How Is much time you have left? I got another like five minutes. You got you got another quick story for me. Yeah, I got a quick story. Here's a great story. We'll wind up with this. You'll love this. Last chapter of the book. Okay, April of 2018. I'm in northern Washington. We're getting the boat ready to go to Alaska. The company has a truck to use, a pickup truck, and all the guys on the crew are out getting drunk all night long. Every night, they don't want to let me use the cr- the truck. So one day, I just said to the the first mate, I said, "Listen, I really need the truck." I need to go do some stuff. And he looks at me like, ah, you know, it gives me a hard time. So I said, you know what? I'll let God handle it. So I walk up to one of my recovery meetings and a guy meets me there. His name is Otis. And anyways, fast forward the next day, Otis shows up at another meeting and says, yesterday you shared something that really touched my heart and I wanted to come and thank you for it. I'm like, wow, that's never happened before. And he says, oh, you, and we started talking. He says, oh, you need a vehicle. And I said, that would be great. And I thought he had a deal on like rent a car or something. He says, well, just come to my house and I'll give you my truck to use for the week and you can drive all around and explore. I'm like, this dude I've only known for an hour of my life is going to be a $40,000 pickup truck to use. Okay. So I find this place called Cap Sante Park in northern Washington in the San Juan Islands. It overlooks the ice and everything, right? So fast forward, I, 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 I wanted to quit my job so much that summer because it was so much chaos. And I said, no, God wants me to stay on here for some reason. I don't know what it is, but there's something big and I got to stay. And fast forward to September, we have a guy on our last day on our journey, an 81 year old man, just a month shy of 82, ends up passing away on the boat while we're heading to Seattle. And so we got to turn around, we go back to the the shore and the the county prosecutor, the coroner, everybody comes on and they go, okay, uh, you know, we're going to send him on a ferry over to the island across the way because that's where the nearest funeral home is. It happened to be Anacortes, Washington, which is where I was when I met Otis six months ago. So I call Otis and I go, hey, I'm coming over there and stuff. And so he picks me and I went with the uh, the lady of the now widow and her two friends that were with her and the husband's body on the thing. We go over to Anacortes. Otis takes us to our hotel and all that stuff. Anyways, the next day before we leave town, I said, Judy. Uh, was the widow's name. I said, I want to take you to one place really special before we leave. And I took her to Cap Sante Park that I found six months ago because Otis, this guy I didn't know, lends me his truck for a week and trust me. 
Well, Cap Sante Park, I brought Judy up there and we had saw this beautiful moon on our ferry ride across the uh, way the night before. And I said, Judy, you see that mountain over there? I said, that's where you saw that beautiful full moon the night before. And her and her husband of 42 years, their favorite things to do were to watch sunsets and moons. So mm -hmm. that was really special to her. And then I turned her and I said, see that building down there? I said, that's the ferry terminal where we walked off last night where your husband's body got ridden off when we got to the ferry terminal. And then I stopped and I actually started crying while I was saying this to her. And I said, you see all this water down here? She said, yeah. I said, that waterway is the last journey that you and your husband of 42 years traveled on last night. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. And I just, I just left her there to have, and that, that was one of the coincidences. I mean, I told that in a very short story, obviously. That's mm. the last chapter in the book. But, you know, I tell that in my recovery meetings and stuff. And people are talking about uh, the possibility of making that into a faith-based film. Because the guy who passed away never believed in God. Mm. And a month before he died, his wife, Judy, went to him in Indiana and said, David, why don't you start praying? And he said, I would, but I'd be a hypocrite. And she said, but you don't believe in God anyway. So if there's no God, you lose nothing. But if there is a God, you gain the whole world. Yeah. Two, two weeks before he passed away. So two weeks later, he comes to her and says, honey, I got to tell you something. I've been praying. And my only prayer is that when I go, I go quickly. Two weeks later, he dies in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on a beautiful sunny day, having spent the last 13 days with his wife and best friend in Alaska, enjoying the bears and the whales and all the glory of God. And God just sat there waiting for him for almost 82 years. And when he did, he answered his only prayer. He took a sip of ginger ale. I was in the room with him. He took a sip of ginger ale. He was sitting on his bed. And all of a sudden, his eyes just rolled back in his head and he went to sleep. Oh, my God. Amazing, man. You know, very cry on it. Very cry on it. Incredible. And um, so that's the last story of the book. So the point is, if you are sitting there right now and you're thinking that you're not loved and appreciated and admired, remember that God created you and he only creates the best. And there's a special purpose for every single one of us in life. Don't compare yourself to everyone else. Out of all the billions of people on this planet, you're the only you. Just be the best you that you can be and you'll have an amazing life. Yeah, man. That's beautiful, man. Hey. Fix what's cutting onions in here <laughs> at midnight. Oh, at midnight. Okay, well, you make it. You make it fun, man. You have such a you have such a wonderful spirit in you. I don't know what you do on uh, when you're not here, but you know you're you're using all that God gave you to be the best that you can be. So thanks for uh, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, thanks for coming out, man. You made my you made my evening very special. Thanks, man. I well think, worth I think, staying up, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. We have to keep in touch. We have to definitely keep in touch. I really, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I gotta get to ask Alaska. I gotta get to Alaska. <laughs> well, I'm gonna be praying for you. It'll happen. <laughs> All right. So give us your handles. Let us know where we can find you. Let the people know. Yeah. So you can go online at Rob R O B. Last name E, like Edward, K, like King, N, like Nancy O, robekno.com. And you can see all about me on there. You can order the book on there. Or you can simply go on Amazon and Amazon, look up my name, and it, you have the paperback, you have the Kindle, and the audiobook as well on Amazon. Is it God or coincidence? Coming to grips with the unexpected wonders in life. There you go. Grab your copy today. Thanks so much for having me, man. This has been an absolute blast. Yeah. And if he's, if only half the energy is in that book, that's in your, the way you present yourself. I'm going to read that book 50 times. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know what? The funny thing is, is I have people that read it and all of a sudden they turn around and read it again the next day because it's yeah. also very easy. I'm a simple guy. So it's an easy read. <laughs> Actually. I don't think you're a simple guy at all, man. I've, I've saw the stuff you've done, man. You're not a simple guy. You're like me, man. We're, we operate at a different frequencies. We're not, we're not simple. <laughs> we look simple from the outside because we're probably smiling. we got this nice energy. But believe me, inside we're deep. Right? That's well, I look really forward cool. to watching this on, on YouTube so I can see how great the, the, the fun that we had here. Yeah, so I'll send you a link. Um, maybe in like an hour or so when everything's all done and dusted. 
Sounds good. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and I wish you all the best. All right, you too, my Mr. Ekno. Ek Thank you. <laughs> See it's not how we start, it's how we end. <laughs> it's how we end, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.